Let me begin by saying that for many years now, I've been arguing that one necessary step in making progress on the climate problem is to understand what kind of problem it is. And it's in that spirit that I give this talk, because I think we need to look the problem clearly in the face and that doing so helps us to move forward towards solutions that actually might work instead of getting distracted by inadequate responses that are caused in part by bad framings of the problem. So I want to start by saying those listening to international leaders immediately after the Paris Agreement was made would probably have had the impression that the meeting was a great success, that it produced exactly what was needed after years of failure, and in particular that the international community could be proud of its efforts to protect the young and other future generations. Here are just a few sample pronouncements, and I'm not going to read them all out, but just highlight a few words that occur, you know, ambitious, binding, universal, we can go back home with our heads held high, a success for the high ambition coalition, one planet, one chance to get it right, and we did it in Paris. This is the strong agreement that the world needed and a monumental success for the planet and its people. So lots of proclamations around success and also lots of statements around protecting future generations. We can be proud to stand before our children and grandchildren. The American people can be proud. We'll leave a world that's safer and more secure for our children. Today, we can look into the eyes of our children and grandchildren and um, tell them that we have finally joined hands to bequeath a more habitable world, world to them and to future generations. One sign though that we should be careful about such declarations is provided by the history of international climate policy. Strikingly similar pronouncements were also made in the immediate aftermath of the Kyoto Climate Agreement and particularly the rescue of it in 2001. Uh, we see the New Zealand Energy Ministry saying we've delivered probably the most comprehensive and difficult agreement in human history. A uh, prominent US expert saying it's by far the strongest environmental treaty that's ever been drafty, as good as it gets in international relations. And uh, the EU Environment Commissioner Margot Wallström saying now we can go home and look our children in the eye and be proud of what we have done. So here, strikingly similar rhetoric across both agreements. But unfortunately, find and a worst, a sham that achieves nothing except the creation of the comfortable illusion that serious progress is being made, which is itself, that illusion is, a substantial obstacle to overcoming the global warming tragedy here. Either way, I said it's hardly a model for future environmental regulation, no cause for optimism as well. And even those who had endorsed it should be wary of looking their children in the eye and none should relish facing their children's children. I also claimed that the central flaw of Kyoto could be explained in terms of the underlying structure of the climate problem, a structure I later called the perfect moral storm. And I thought that this had yet to be fully appreciated, especially in its intergenerational aspect, and that until we did better there, we would be doomed to an ineffectual environmental policy. As I just mentioned, as it turned out, it became um, widely accepted that Kyoto did not really work. Uh, in terms of the emissions reductions achieved, the answer would be no when asked that question. Ivo Dubois said, the Executive Secretary of the UN Climate Secretariat in December 2008, just as the Kyoto um, final period was, was opening. Um, and John Schulnahuber said that Kyoto is simply a miserable precursor of the global regime intended to deliver genuine climate stabilization, stabilization and was never expected to be more. So in this paper, in this talk, I wanna ask the, for me, natural follow-up questions. Does the Paris Agreement succeed where Kyoto failed? Is it the agreement we were all looking for? And in particular, does it address the underlying structure of the climate problem 
including the threat to the young and other future generations? Or is it another weak agreement that perpetuates a dangerous illusion of progress? So before I delve into those questions, just want to say a little bit about my more general analysis in the book um, of, of a decade ago. So over the last two decades, I've argued that climate change poses a distinctive challenge to ethical action that I've come to call the perfect moral storm. The phrase the perfect moral storm became prominent through Sebastian Younger's true story of the Andrea Gale, which is a fishing vessel caught at sea during a convergence of several independently powerful storms with fatal consequences. Thus, a perfect storm involves the convergence of independently harmful factors where this convergence is likely to result in severe, possibly catastrophic negative outcomes. By analogy, the perfect moral storm involves the convergence of a number of factors that challenge our ability to behave ethically, and so throws down the gauntlet to us as ethical agents, and especially to our moral and political systems. In the case of climate change, the converging factors, or storms as I call them, are that the problem is genuinely global, strongly intergenerational, crosses species boundaries, and occurs in a setting where our theories and institutions are weak. Each storm creates serious temptations for unethical action, and when they come together, they're mutually reinforcing and seriously compromise the prospects for ethically responsible behavior. Moreover, this convergence encourages a lurking problem of what I call moral corruption. Since ethically indefensible action is tempting, especially for the current generation of the more affluent, they are likely to favor ways of thinking and talking about the climate change problem that obscure what's going on. Now, this is not the place to rehearse all of the perfect storm analysis. So instead here, I'm just going to highlight four central aspects that are especially relevant to our examination of Paris. And they're gonna be the tyranny of the contemporary, moral corruption, and two issues surrounding the marginalization of fairness. So let's begin with the tyranny of the contemporary, which is a central part of the intergenerational storm. Tyranny of the contemporary, I think, is a distinctive kind of elective, sorry, of collective action problem. Um, and it arises in part because climate change comes with significant time lags. Specifically, there is a temporal dispersion of causes and effects. And that's what I'll focus on. Here, one reason that there is this temporal dispersion of causes and effects is that some of the physical processes initially triggered by emissions may take decades, centuries, even millennia to unfold. For example, sea level rise, uh, release of methane from the oceans and so on. Another reason is the time lags, sorry, for the time lags is the long atmospheric lifetime of carbon dioxide as represented in this quote here. So these kind of time lags have implications for how we understand the climate problem. For instance, they imply that the problem is backloaded. There are delays between causes and effect. So we do not see the full impacts of what we've done until sometime after the damage has already effectively um, been done or committed to it. The flip side of this is that the full impacts of what we do now are often substantially deferred. There will be a price to be paid, but not yet, and not necessarily by us, at least not in full. This has unfortunate impacts on the incentives facing different temporal groups, including different generations of political leadership and those holding power in society. So we can illustrate this with a very simple idealized kind of model. Imagine a sequence of temporally distinct groups, you know, group one, group two, group three, and so on, spread out over time, T1, T2, and so on. Suppose we assume that each member of a given group belongs only to that group, so there's no overlapping group membership, that each group is concerned only with what happens with its own time frame, and each group can only affect later groups, not earlier ones. Suppose then that each group has the opportunity to engage in what I'll call front-loaded activities, practices that benefit that group, but whose costs come later to groups further along in the temporal sequence. And focus in particular on a subset of those front-loaded activities where the benefits to each group are modest, but the costs to later groups are severe. This simple model gives rise to a grim scenario. Under these kinds of assumptions, since each is concerned only with 
the modest benefits arising during its own period and is indifferent to the wider costs, we can expect that each group will continually pass the buck to the future by engaging in front-loaded activities whenever it can. Worse, since each group will do this, piling more and more costs onto future groups, there will be a multiplier effect over time, resulting in a dramatic accumulation of impacts in the further future. Yet surely, other things being equal, this kind of intergenerational buck passing, as I call it, will be prohibited by any reasonable ethical theory, including theories of justice. Now, in my view, this kind of collective action problem, the tyranny of the contemporary, is a standing a threat in human affairs. I think it occurs over various timescales involving temporal groups of different sizes or durations. And it also arises in different settings, for example, within nations, across governments, uh, within corporations, and even within families and so on. And I think it's manifest in the real world in various degenerate or impure forms, including um, when it comes to many of our most severe social problems. One key place where the tyranny arises is with the incentives faced by the current generation of political leaders and those who hold generational power in society. This threat, I think, is often ignored in public discussion and in political and policy analysis. Indeed, the background assumption of a lot of analysis is that national governments or countries as a whole can be relied upon to be effective intergenerational stewards of the interests of their citizens and over many generations. For example, many analyze the climate problem using the traditional tragedy of the commons or prisoner's dilemma models and make the assumption that current governments are effective intergenerational stewards. Yet, I think the tyranny of the contemporary suggests that that background assumption is naive and dangerously so. This brings me, this worry about naivete, brings me naturally to a second component of the perfect moral storm analysis, the problem of moral corruption. Now, the, wor the word corruption has two core meanings. The first is distortion or altered form for the worse, the perversion of anything from an original state of purity. And the second is immoral or dishonest, especially as shown by the exploitation of a position of power or trust for personal gain. Both of these meanings, I think, play a role in the problem of moral corruption as I see it. The perverse incentives in the perfect moral storm pose a threat to the discourse, to the very ways in which we talk and think about the climate problem. Now, moral corruption can arise in many ways, and here are some familiar modes of them. Observers of the climate change debate probably recognize many of these, I think. The most obvious, of course, is unreasonable doubt, given the decades of climate denialism playing out in the public sphere. But the one that I want to highlight today is pandering the act of catering to, to or profiting from the weaknesses, vices, or the unreasonable desires of others. In the climate case, I've been concerned for a, while, for a long time about what I call shadow solutions. That is proposals for action that do not respond to the real problem, in this case, the central ethical challenges of climate change, but instead focus on much more limited concerns of those with the power to influence policy. Now, in past periods, we would often see shadow solutions take the form of inaction, um, so just business as usual, or else a moderated wait and see kind of policy. But crucially, I've emphasized that shadow solutions are likely to evolve over time, in particular in response to the increasing severity of the problem and the aging of the generations affected. In particular, a decade ago, I predicted that shadow strategies based on generation relative concerns would become more friendly towards mitigation as time goes on and the threats increase, but also support a heavier emphasis on geoengineering adaptation and military preparations. So here is a, a simple model that I will just you know glance at really um, from, from the book uh, of 2011. So suppose that you imagine that political power is held by two generational groups, those 40 to 60 and those 60 to 80. Suppose you assume a life expectancy of roughly 80 um, and time lags before major impacts from current emissions of 20 years or more. 
And suppose you also assume that severe ongoing impacts that affect daily life in a sustained way are likely to occur starting in 2050 to 2100, or at least that's the period of them. Um, then divide the gender, sorry, then divide the political decision making into periods, um, 20 year periods roughly, starting in 1990. And you get these different sets of generations. And that enables you to generate some rough predictions of what you might expect in terms of climate action, depending on which generations are in power and what their time horizons are. And the rough summary of this model was that we'd expect very weak action, um, maybe just business as usual in period one from 1990 to 2009, improved but still modest all around action in period two, 2010 to 2029. Um, by period three, you get, should get more significant improvement around mitigation, but the real push will be elsewhere around adaptation, military buildup, and especially geoengineering. Now, my point here is just that this suggests to us that moving forward somewhat on mitigation, right, is not a sign that you're really dealing effectively with the problem. It can be still a sign of a strato, sorry, a shadow strategy playing out. Um, so this can be a way in which people can say, continue to say, we've done badly in the past, we're getting better, but, and that's something, isn't it? Even though they're not effectively dealing with the problem. And so I think it doesn't subvert the perfect moral storm analysis to argue that Paris makes some progress, right? you need to be able to show that it makes sufficient progress and progress of the right kind. So it's no longer plausible to see the international process as a shadow solution masquerading as the real thing. The th last part of the analysis that I want to emphasize, um, last two features, sorry, both um, concern the marginalization of fairness. So in the climate ethics literature, there's a fairly broad consensus on what I call the burden claim, that richer and more developed countries should shoulder most of the burden of action, at least initially. But major threats um, are posed to, to fairness by two things in particular. One, the problem of skewed vulnerabilities, and the other, the risk of unholy alliances against the future. So the problem of skewed vulnerabilities, which is often noticed now, is that those who contribute the least greenhouse gases or have done historically will be the most impacted by climate change and vice versa. And that disrupts incentives around contributing to solutions. Um, the threat of unholy alliances is that trying to do something to improve skewed vulnerabilities doesn't necessarily um, result in protecting the future. In fact, the conflict can emerge between the two um, objectives of furthering fairness. In particular, more affluent members of poor countries may be co-opted by poorer, sorry, may co-opt poorer fellow citizens in pressing for fossil fuel expansion in the name of benefiting the poor now and thereby receive their support in a tyranny of, contempor of the contemporary against the future. So if these are our problems, how might we move forward? Well, back in the original article in the early work, I suggested some features of a successor regime for Kyoto, Kyoto what, that were clear and not at all utopian and that meeting these kinds of objectives, I said, would be a sign we're on the right track. So the first one had to do with ambition. We need a global cap on, cap on emissions that should be tighter than Kyoto and gradually and explicitly lower over time. Second one involved universal participation. Full cooperation, I said, is required. So all countries should be explicitly included and restrictions accepted by almost everyone. There needed to be a uh, strong compliance regime that was tied to other global issues such as trade. And we needed to address some of these concerns around fairness, particularly around um, 
equitable shares of um, the resources provided by the atmosphere and responsibility for impacts that are not going to be avoided. So where does that, or how does that set of criteria look when one looks at Paris? Well, I suggest initially I'd, I'd argue Kyoto, Kyoto fails on all of them. And then there are two different readings of Paris, right? There's one optimistic reading that's fairly uh, common among um, certain kinds of diplomats and those involved in, in the process, um, which says Paris does a pretty good job on each of these criteria. But then there's also a pessimistic analysis, which says, no, it doesn't, it fails on those criteria. And unfortunately, I'm gonna be arguing that the pessimistic view of Paris looks more plausible at the moment. So let's start with ambition. What would be the optimistic view of ambition? Well, as we've seen, some have claimed that Paris is a success for the high ambition coalition. And the sort of evidence you see offered for that is that the agreement does say it will hold the increase to well below two degrees and pursue efforts to limit to 1.5, that it aims to reach a global peak in emissions as soon as possible and achieve net zero, zero emissions in the second half of the century, that each country's contribution will represent progression and reflect its highest possible ambition. And then subsequently to Paris, we've seen the emergence of countries making commitments to reach net zero by particular target years, usually 2050, or perhaps 2060. What should we say on the pessimistic side? Because after all, those things are all very impressive and suggest we're doing well with respect to the ambition criteria. Unfortunately, a pessimistic interpretation says that these claims are misleading and that Paris is much less ambitious than it initially appears. One issue is that the legal status of the agreement is weak and deliberately so. It's been designed to be a weak agreement from a legal point of view. Second, there are major doubts about how realistic the targets are. In particular, they're out of step with analyses of the current trajectory of emissions. Prior to the pandemic, these were creeping up at around 1% or more per year globally, rather than sharply coming down. And many countries were planning increases rather than reductions. Third, as has been well documented, there's a major emissions gap between the Paris pledges and the overall goals. Even if fully implemented, projections suggest that the 2015 pledges would result in somewhere between 2.7 and 3.7 degree Celsius temperature rise, which is well above the 1.5 and 2 degree targets. And fourth, mainstream projections are based on optimistic assumptions. They aim at only a 50% chance or 66% chance of avoiding dangerous climate change. They assume mid-range climate sensitivities rather than higher range ones. And perhaps most notably, they build in a major deployment of carbon removal technologies starting in 2030, even though these technologies have not yet been developed at scale and may be expensive to deploy. In short, this is not the approach that one would expect if, Sarah, if sorry, Paris really were a serious effort to protect the future against severe climate change. Consequently, the specters of the tyranny of the contemporary and of moral corruption loom large here. I'm sorry, I went in the wrong direction there. Uh, this is the sort of thing that led the UN Secretary General last December to say, we're heading for a thundering temperature rise of three to five degrees. The world needs to decrease fossil fuel production by roughly 6% every year between now and 2030. Instead, it's going in the opposite direction, planning an annual increase of 2%. What about the participation um, criteria? Again, there's an optimistic reading of this. Uh, Ban Ki-moon said in 2015, for the first time, every country in the world has pledged to curb emissions. And it's true that Paris says that all parties are to undertake, undertake ambitious efforts and that it includes uh, almost all the countries in the world at this point. Um, optimists also say that the mechanisms that Paris employs uh, this bottom-up mechanism where each country voluntarily generates and submits its own climate action plan is a much better way to go than under the Kyoto model and constitutes a decisive break with that model. Um, and one that 
is likely to induce motivation on the part of the parties. Um, for example, countries don't have to act in the same ways on the same basis, but can bring their own values and priorities to bear. They're expected to compete to outdo each other in becoming green in a so-called race to the top that has material advantages in getting ahead in green technology, but also confers status internationally. And the public nature of the commitments is supposed to provide a name and shame mechanism as no country will want to be seen as a climate laggard. But of course, there are quite pessimistic readings of these very same ideas. Um, and in particular to the idea that this is a decisive break with the past and its failures, many have claimed it's more of a repackaging of what we've been doing over time. So for instance, the UN process was already formally universal in that all parties were in theory committed to respecting the objective of avoiding dangerous climate change and since 2009, specifically to the two, two degree limit. Meaningful additional universality therefore needs to go beyond formal inclusion to involve significant cuts in emissions. But second, on this issue, Paris is somewhat disappointing. As we have seen, ambition is much less than is needed and real action even more so. Moreover, the division between developing and developed countries remains enshrined in the agreement in much the way as it was before. Um, for example, under the, under the Paris division, China and India, those submitting uh, NDCs, both continue to expand their emissions uh, and on grounds of pulling their citizens out of poverty. Third, the shape of the commitments of developing countries raises worries about unholy alliances against the future. For example, in 2015, in its NDC, India demanded compensation of trillions of dollars from the international community for pursuing an individual, sorry, an alternative energy path. There are more general worries about the bottom-up strategy. First, these are voluntary commitments, the NDCs, and arise in a context where previous voluntary commitments have failed to deliver. Second, the commitments are often vague, including by being difficult to interpret and access, and so also potentially manipulable by those making them, manipulable to suit their own purposes. And third, the initial commitments were relatively shallow and so easy to make, whereas actual implementation is difficult and costly. For these kinds of reasons, some analysts have raised the possibility that the Paris regime may amount to what they call organized hypocrisy, where in particular, they may promote a situation where, as they put it, the developing countries pretend to reduce emissions and the developed countries pretend, them, pretend to pay them to do so. What about accountability next criterion? and in particular compliance. Well, there is something genuinely new in the Paris Agreement. That's the idea of a global stop take, which is set to occur at five year intervals beginning in 2023, and where parties will assess the collective progress towards achieving the purpose of the agreement and the targets. But what are we to say about this kind of approach? Well, one obvious problem is that the new mechanism is underdeveloped and untested. Uh, one commentator, as one commentator put it, um, the accountability mechanisms um, elevate vagueness to a art form. Um, the second concern is that many of the issues that would need to be confronted in the stock take, precisely those that the international community have failed to access, that, sorry, address over the last 30 years, including questions about equity, responsibility, and burden sharing. And a third concern is that the whole approach has been constrained from the outset in ways that may make it prime to fail. For one thing, the assessment is constrained in radical ways. The assessment is to be of the collective achievement it's supposed to be non-adversarial and non-punitive. So there's not even an intent to hold individual countries to account. And indeed, um, the way the assessment is done seems to count against that. And then, of course, as with previous agreements, it's easy for countries to exit the agreement and with no penalty if they fail. 
So given all this, the new mechanism seems at best to be a huge gamble in a setting where previous gambles have failed and where the whole enterprise is subject to ongoing political fragility, not just in the US, which of course has already exited once, but in other countries around the world. What about fairness? Well, initially there seemed to be some good signs in the Paris Agreement, procedurally, despite the ongoing resistance of some countries, key principles of equity and common and differentiated responsibilities retained, uh, and the idea of doing something about loss and damage remains uh, in the agreement. And substantively, there's a commitment to the 1.5 degree goal, and that there are further sections addressing the need for assistance to less developed countries in terms of various things, but in particular, the Green Climate Fund and its aim of providing $100 billion per year by 2020 to help poorer countries deal with climate impacts. Unfortunately, when it comes to practice, there are reasons for suspicion. In general, the structure of the agreement itself appears to reflect skewed vulnerabilities rather than address them. Some analysts say that Paris mostly reflects of the current concerns of the US and China and is toughest in its approach on Africa, which is arguably the most vulnerable continent. Second, given the ambition gap and other structural flaws of Paris, the 1.5 degree goal looks very fragile and some countries appear to regard it as aspirational. And third, assistance for less developed countries remains under a cloud. For example, the Green Climate Fund remains underfunded, with those funds that are provided often being redirected from other areas of international aid against the explicit intention of the agreement. And similarly, loss and damage remains largely unexplored territory, while the question of equal shares is largely ignored and some say undercut by the general trajectory of the emissions. In light of all this then, continued reference to equity and responsibility in the agreement could plausibly be seen as mere window dressing rather than reflecting serious commitments by the international community. So how does all this look when we look return to the perfect moral storm analysis? Well, if we begin with the tyranny of the contemporary, there are multiple lines of ev evidence for its existence in various forms. For instance, as has become customary in climate agreements, most of the important decisions have again been deferred. The actual ambition remains relatively low and assessed against dubious baselines of probability, climate sensitivity, and so on. What ambition there is seems to stand in conflict with more concrete realities on the ground. And again, there are no serious efforts at either enforcement or linking progress to other central global issues such as trade and security. Instead, we're left with a voluntary, vague, non-adversarial regime in a situation where a much more robust institutional architecture is clearly warranted and needed. The evidence for moral corruption, unfortunately, is, if anything, even stronger. There's a huge gap between the way, way the deal is presented to the global public and how much it actually achieves. It's more of a repackaging than a decisive break with the past. Key elements, as I mentioned, elevate vagueness to an art form. Support for it is shaped more by narrow contemporary political in interests, analysts say, than by concern for future generations. And that support is likely to be shallow. Moreover, if I had more time, I'd show you examples of all this. Some many prominent experts have been moved to describe Paris as a fantasy, a fraud, worthless words, organized hypocrisy, nothing more than a feel-good statement at best and painfully false promises at the worst, embodying either total cynicism or total delusion and bearing no relationship at all to the reality of what governments and their business partners are actually doing today. And these are the sorts of things that led Clive Spash to say some a few years ago um, that his worry was that climate change can now conveniently slip off the media agenda until the time comes for the next major COP meeting, which he called COP, COP out in 2023 when the stock taking occurs but few of those responsible will be around and none will be ever held accountable. So what do we do in this kind of situation where the pessimistic reading looks plausible um, and so a major threat? Well, one approach might be to try to make it the right treaty 
even if it isn't at the moment. Um, one prospect is that Paris might serve as at least a rallying point for those committed to taking climate action, an umbrella, if you like, under which genuine progress might occur. And there's some good news here in that there are multiple opportunities for progress, including from new technologies, from the pandemic rebound, and renewed US engagement in the climate sphere. Still, the momentum for all this will notably have to come from beyond Paris itself and from within uh, countries, not from the international community and the agreement as such. So this means that avoiding the worst still requires a dramatic and unprecedented effort in all countries of significant economic size, size led by courageous leaders, supported by mass movements, and facilitated, facilitated by serious social, technological, and ethical innovation. Thus, climate progress will, I think, necessitate a spectacular mobilization, either around Paris itself, a new initiative, or more likely, both at the same time. How are we to achieve this? Well, my own view is that one crucial component of success will require recognizing and then confronting the tyranny of the contemporary. Because I think one major root of our problem is institutional. While the social systems that are currently dominant may be good for promoting short-term and narrowly economic interests, we lack institutions that are effective for intergenerational and ecological concerns. So elsewhere, I have proposed that we develop the idea of and advocate for the establishment of a global constitutional convention akin to the American Constitutional Convention of 1787 and directed towards thinking about the future. This convention, I think, would address the issue of how to design effective institutions to confront the perfect moral storm in general, and especially the threats of a tyranny of the contemporary at the global level. It would take seriously the limitations of, but also the need to effectively integrate with existing institutions, especially at the national level. It need not officially replace the Paris process, but could evolve alongside it. Nevertheless, my concern is that without a robust institutional approach or its functional equivalent, effective climate policy is likely to remain beyond us. So, of course, I recognize that this is a difficult thing to achieve. Um, but here I'm reminded of a quote from George Washington when the US Federal Constitutional Convention was in trouble in 1787 and he was invited to address it. He said, it's too probable that no plan we propose will be adopted. Perhaps another dreadful conflict is to be sustained. But if to please the people, we offer what we ourselves disprove, how can we work, we afterwards defend our work? Let us raise a standard to which the wise and the honest can repair. The event is in the hand of God. So in conclusion, what have I done in this paper? Well, I reminded us of some remarks uh, in Paris about how we can be proud of the Paris Agreement um, and can look into the eyes of our children and grandchildren and I've said, I don't think that's the case. I asked these key questions. Does Paris succeed where Kyoto failed? And in particular, does it address the underlying structure of the climate problem? I think not, unfortunately. I think it's yet another triumph of hope over experience. It can provide a rallying point around which progress could be made. It does represent the good intentions of many and may well facilitate some advances Nevertheless, it falls far short of the robust response we need and does not address the central problems of past agreements. This is obviously very disappointing given the magnitude of the threat and the time the international community has had to prepare to meet it. It does not mean that the international process is necessarily doomed, but it does imply that it needs saving. So as with Kyoto, even though have those who have endorsed Paris should be wary of looking the children and the grandchildren in the eye. And sadly, the perfect moral storm provides an explanation in particular around these specters of the tyranny of the contemporary moral corruption, skewed vulnerabilities and unholy alliances. Um, sorry, that went in the wrong, oops. <laughs> um, 
And as I just said, um, the hard work still lies ahead, still requires very significant um, action and especially at the political level. And ultimately, I think part of the solution is going to involve something like a global constitutional convention for future generations. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much um, for your very interesting and enlightening talk. Um, the paper is now open for discussion. So anyone who would like to ask a question or offer a comment can raise their hand and I'll uh, try to keep um, the order in which you raise your hand. And Hans Petrogava is first, please, Hans Petro. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for this uh, interesting and uh, important uh, speech. Um, I, I find uh, my, my background is in law, so of course uh, I, I find this uh, suggestion of a constitutional convention uh, very interesting. But I just wanted to know if you could elaborate a little bit on. Uh, how uh, who who should uh, be invited to take part in this convention and uh, and how should one go about and uh, uh, the second part of the question is how should one then go about to secure support because one thing is having a convention and uh, uh, elaborating uh, a text or a setup of an institution but then this has to be implemented uh, probably through uh, the uh, uh, legislators or, or national assemblies of the different countries and do you have any thoughts about this process? Thank you. Thank you. Those are, are great questions um, and I'm trying to write a book about them <laughs> right now. Um, so of course I'm not going to be able to give, give you a, a full answer um, for various reasons including maybe I should have given the talk about that rather than about the problem. Um, but here's something about the general direction or the general way in which I, I think about this. I think we do suffer from what I think of as a, a governance gap, or you might think of as a democratic deficit when it comes to um, our concern for future generations or the future of humanity as a whole. So I think we currently lack institutions that are well formed to represent these genuine concerns that we have. Um, so in principle, there should not be, um, in principle, crucially, there should not be a serious problem in justifying the emergence of these new kinds of institutions because there's a gap. Um, in practice, of course, there is a big issue about how to integrate them with existing institutions and whether existing institutions will accept that there is a gap and whether they'll accept <laughs> that any particular methodology for resolving it. Um, and this does have implications as the first part of your question suggests for um, how to think about how to form the global constitutional convention itself. In particular, uh, I think in, it, in an offhand way, I, I sometimes say, probably the last thing we want is for the finance ministers of the major nations to get together and have a global constitutional convention for future generations. Why? Because their whole way of thinking, their whole way of um, operating what they've been trained to do is much more likely to reflect the short term, very and narrowly economic approach to evaluating the future than it is to represent um, long-term intergenerational concern in the way that we would want a constitutional convention to, um, to successfully do. But what I say in, in some of the, the couple of papers I have published on this is, I think these are the questions we should be asking, right? So I can make the proposal for a global constitutional convention itself directed towards future generations. Um, and that proposal can be a good one, then the next stage is to go through considering different models and approaches to how to organize it and what it's supposed to deliver and so on. And that I think is a different part of the project and one which other people can get involved in as well. And I don't claim a particular monopoly of knowledge about these things. There are many people who know a lot about constitutional conventions in general say, and about political processes who could contribute. 
I think political philosophy and ethics has a role to play there in thinking about what the norms should be governing, say, things like representation and governing the long term aims of the project. But um, that's not the only part of the project. So in a way, I invite others in to help with that part, as well as working on a book of my own. Thank you. The next question is from Dag Olav Hessen, please. Yeah, thank you again for a great and, and provocative thought. Uh, as an evolutionary biologist, I'm always uh, wondering whether this has to do with uh, this discounting of the future generations of humans has to do with our evolutionary past. I mean, it, it has always made sense in the history to maximize intake and, and use, uh, while this is clearly not the, the, the right strategy today. But actually, my question is, is slightly different, and it has to do with uh, another potential failure of the, uh, the Paris Agreement. Uh, I'm also head of a center for biogeochemistry and Anthropocene, and there we work with feedbacks in the carbon cycle and uh, uh, actually these issues that have, in the first case, been the reason why 1.2 or 1.5 or 2 degrees has been set as a target, this risk of dangerous feedback and uh, eventually even tipping points in the global systems. So the, the Paris Agreement does really not, not look seriously into to this issue of loss of nature and also loss of ecosystem, ecosystem processes uh, and species loss, um, which to me is essential for understanding and, and also counteracting these, these dangerous tipping points. So I wonder if you have a comment on, on that issue. I do think those are very important issues. Um, and I'm inclined to agree that Paris doesn't take them seriously. So my main comment would be to agree with you. There is another part of the perfect storm analysis, which I call the ecological storm, which might be relevant um, to this and how we would expect this kind of neglect to play out. Um, I'd also say in regard to your first comment about our evolutionary challenge and the way um, humans have evolved, um, which may be unhelpful <laughs> for long-term development of humanity. And I, I don't know what the truth is about that, but I would say if there is a problem there, then that at this moment is a major evolutionary challenge that we have to resolve. So um, I'm hoping that other parts of us, including um, our sensitivity to moral concerns and concerns of justice and so on will play a role in driving our social evolution in a better way so that we can overcome some of those perhaps natural instincts we have. But good questions, thank you. Thank you. The next question is from Christina Voigt, please. Thank you very much for your interesting uh, presentation and, and I completely subscribe to your uh, perfect moral storm theory. Uh, but when it comes to the Paris Agreement, I. I, I, I beg to differ. Um, okay. I think I agree with you that the uh, Paris Agreement is an umbrella agreement. I think you, you, you characterized it as such. Um, and I think it works in a way that if we don't take it seriously, if we talk it down, it weakens. And if we take it seriously and talk it up, um, it gains strength. And I think that um, both politicians, but also scholars, uh, whether they're philosophers or lawyers, I'm a law professor at the University of Oslo, need to put our knowledge and expertise behind it to make it stronger and, and to, to enhance its impact. Because I think um, the, the most dangerous thing we currently can do is to take the pressure away from the agreement, the pressure that the agreement actually uh, exer exerts on, on states, um, because that uh, leaves us in a vacuum. There's nothing else there. I, I, I like your idea of a global constitution, but it's not in place. So if the agreement falters, we have nothing to replace it with, and that would take a lot of uh, focus away. And also thinking about an alternative, I think the world that we're seeing right now where several states are you know, doing their own bit uh, is very unlikely to, to come up with any alternative to the, to the agreement. But I, I would like to, to hear your thoughts on that. Um, 
that we actually need to strengthen it to, to keep the, the race uh, to, to zero um, uh, on. Two short comments on uh, particular aspects. You mentioned the emission gap, and I think you're right. Uh, we just had the synthesis report from the Secretariat. But we also have to remember that the um, NDCs, most of the NDCs were submitted prior to 2015, prior to the PIS agreement's adoption. And the real point in time when, when parties have to submit the next bounce is in 2025. And I think it's very important to keep the pressure on that uh, juncture in time and to use the um, principles in the agreement progression and highest possible ambition in national processes and international work to uh, increase the level of ambition of, of what's, uh, what parties put forward. And the processes uh, established under the agreement, you mentioned the stock take, you did mention the compliance committee. Um, I, I happen to be the co-chair of the compliance committee. Um, these have just kicked a motion and some of them haven't even kicked a motion yet, like the stock take, like the transparency framework, the, the first reports are due in 2020. 24. I think it's very early to judge on these processes. Rather, we should use our, our energy to, to strengthen them and make sure that they actually do work. Thank you. That was a, a great comment. Um, and uh, yeah, one that I, I guess I expected. Uh, first thing, the conciliatory thing to say, <laughs> I think here is I, I have no objection to people going on and trying to make Paris work and perpetuating the positive illusion, as I put it. Um, I don't think that we need to view even my Global Constitutional Convention and Paris as, you know, distinct rivals, right? I think we probably need both at the same time. But I also think that there were worries about, you know, make sure we talk it up, um, don't talk it down, um, because I feel like I've been hearing this for a very long time. Um, it was said about Kyoto. It was said about Copenhagen by some people. Um, and now it's also being said about Paris. And I think we do need to look very clearly in the face, the problems we're actually facing here. And um, although it's it's gratifying that the work is going on and you're hopeful about what will happen in 2024 with stock takes and 2025 with the next round of NDCs. Um, there's still some way in the future where this problem has been developing for 30 years now and the current numbers around emission gaps and you know plans for further development are alarming. So I guess I think in some of the communities I'm move in, perhaps it makes a difference to be based in the US setting, there's, there's kind of a sense that, oh, for climate, we've already basically succeeded because Paris exists and we're back in it. And that is so far from what's true either in the US or globally that I actually think it's time to put the pressure in, pr pressure on including by pointing out the defects of Paris. One way to look at this is sometimes I view myself as the bad cop of um, <laughs> international climate policy. There are plenty of people going around playing good cop, <laughs> um, but I think we need both. Um, we certainly, I think, don't need merely being a good cop. So I'm sorry we disagree about that, but I still appreciate all the work you're doing. Thank you. Ola Bielsvik is next, please. Uh, thank, thank you very much for a very engaging and very powerful talk. And I, I want to uh, go back to some of what you said about um, the fundamental situation, where we can think of each generation as being placed in relation to the next generation in a way which has a sort of formal parallel in the tragedy of the commons that's been addressed in, in economics. But it's also a deep difference to that in the fact that the agents are not around at the same time. So this makes it very, very hard to see how you can achieve anything like the sort of solutions that we've seen 
uh, addressing something like the tragedy of the commons. Furthermore, of course, the way I see it, you present something that is um, that aims to to be a, a way forward that can deal with a fundamental matter here, with the convention and what you're saying. So that seems to me to be two very important challenges that you probably have thought a lot about, but you want you to, to say something more about them. And the first, of course, is that um, the actual decisions will always be made by the present generation, also in a system like that. So it would take a lot to make the future generation's interests um, <clears throat> felt in the right sort of way in the decision making. Uh, of course, there are ways of doing it, but it's a real challenge. Then the other thing that you've been extremely good at is to describe the phenomenon of moral corruption. So it seems to me that these two things together, because morality is a very general ability, if there's some sort of corruption, it spreads across the board, so to speak. So these two things, the need to have the interests of generations quite far into the future, into the decision-making, while we're still suffering from our corruption, seems to me to be an extremely difficult situation to handle. And I'm very, very glad you're thinking about this, but uh, if you can say a little bit more, because this seems to be, to be me to be very, very deep challenges for any such mm -hmm. thing as you suggest. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's a, a very nice way of, of putting things and uh, underlines the gravity of our situation. I do think our situation is very grave. Uh, I've been arguing that, you know, over the last 20 years or so. It's why I think of it as a perfect moral storm and a challenge to the current generation and really to humanity as such as a previous uh, speaker suggested. I do think, I mean, let, let's be clear, there is a prospect here that the tyranny of the contemporary, which I think of as a much worse kind of collective action problem than the traditional tragedy of the commons or prisons dilemma, right? It's distinct from it and it's much worse. It might be a problem that is not going to be solved, right? Um, and uh, and one reason it might not be being going to be resolved might be, as some people who read my work say, that we're just not going to get beyond intergenerational or generational ruthlessness, right? That particular generations will be more than willing to exploit the tyranny of the contemporary and try to cover it up with moral corruption and so on. And there's nothing in my analysis that says that that is not the case, <laughs> right? That's an empirical question, how it will actually work out. And there's nothing that I can say um, that will disprove that as a possibility. On the other hand, my view has been more optimistic than that, because I think a big part, at least, of what's driving the problem is the institutional gap. The fact we have this governance gap or democratic deficit and so on. I think there are many people around the world who ha do have serious concern for future generations and for the future of humanity, but at the moment there are not effective institutional structures to transmit that kind of concern into action. And of course that will be a central uh, matter for the Global Constitutional Convention to address. Right? I mean that involves empirical claims on my part about you know how many people are motivated what central concerns they have and it includes that many of those concerns are ethical concerns in fact it's an empirical claim i could be wrong about it but i actually you know think that it's there and you don't have to have everybody right there can be lots of people perhaps who don't have those kind of concerns we just need a kind of critical mass of people um, who are very concerned along with enough people who are mildly concerned or at least won't oppose <laughs> making progress in these areas, which is maybe how political change usually occurs anyway, right? So I'm not looking for unanimity um, here, but it's a way in which, you know, I confess my account is 
optimistic. I also tend to think I'm, I tend to be more optimistic, at least about the possibility of doing a global constitutional convention and getting it moving fairly quickly. Because after all, I think the American constitutional convention, you know, didn't take that long, <laughs> was implemented within a couple of years. And it was confronting a problem that you might have predicted in advance they would be unable to solve because many of the delegates and the whole political situation was such they were kind of dragged into this situation of needing to to come up with new institutions kicking and screaming it was not something they really wanted to do and that may be the case here but that doesn't mean that uh, it's impossible um, or that it needs to take forever to implement thank you that's a great question Thank you. The next question is from Cecilia Melvinson, please. Thank you, Professor Gardner, for an excellent uh, talk. I um, have a, a question. Uh, uh, your conventional, uh, I mean, your convention, uh, constitutional convention, seems to require, again, that countries collaborate in solutions, uh, just like the United Nations uh, um, pathway of, of solutions. Um, but uh, it's also been said that this issue, uh, regardless of generational differences, it's also a, 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 um, a conflict between 100 companies that will benefit from status quo versus the rest of the world, which will benefit from a transition to a, a low carbon society or a no carbon society. Um, so could you see a way to reframe it away from countries that are supposed to deliver services to their um, the people and are elected every year towards a real issue between those who will benefit and those who will not benefit from, from a transition. Uh, is there room for that in your solution? Yes, there is in this sense. The first thing I would say is I don't necessarily assume that the delegates to the convention or the constitutional structure that then emerges will be based on countries. Okay. Um, I think that's a very important question to talk about as we're generating, you know, designing what the convention should look like. And that's partly because in the long term, it's not clear to me that um, countries are the most relevant units <laughs> to, to be thinking about. Um, so at one point in one of the early articles, I suggest, you know, we might be talking more regionally about eco-regions or, or things of this sort, because they might be more salient over the long term um, for ecological reasons, but also because maybe countries aren't so relevant um, over the kinds of time periods that we're, we're talking about, right? Um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure where my ancestors were a thousand years ago or <laughs> 2000 years ago, but I'm pretty sure they weren't right here in Seattle. <laughs> Right. Um, so it might be that trying to construct a constitutional convention um, on country lines is not quite the right way to do it. Um, and then uh, the second thing is to say is you're clearly right that any approach to dealing with global concerns, including global intergenerational concerns, will have to think about how to conf how to confront the global institutional system, as it were, that includes things like the impact of large corporations, right? And the problems that emerge because there's a sense in which when they're transnational, and very seriously transnational, that it looks as though there aren't any effective institutions to, um, to manage them. And that seems like a long run problem for humanity, not just in the case of climate change, but in case of many issues, right? If you have very powerful entities that are not actually um, accountable in any way to the global population, that's going to be a serious concern moving forward in the history of humanity. So clearly something will have to be done there. Thank you, good questions. Thank you. We have one more question from Elizabeth Rocklev, please. Thank you for the uh, talk. And you actually came into my issue with your last answer, because what I 
see is sort of a, a solution or prevention of, for disaster for the humanity. It isn't only a thing of uh, climate change or uh, anything like that. It's really for the humanity to survive. And uh, it could, and maybe should also involve anything that could destroy humanity, for example, nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. And there are other things that also would destroy humanity if we uh, continue on the ethical path that we are, that we are the superior on the earth. And we don't need to uh, think about anything else living on the earth. So I think, uh, I mean, uh, if you say a constitutional convention, then it has to be something that is to prevent uh, disaster for the humanity. What do you think about sort of widening it like that? Yes, a uh, great question. And uh, in fact, I, I usually do, I must have forgotten to emphasize this here, when I'm giving the talks about the Global Constitutional Convention, I strongly emphasize that climate change is not the only problem that has this form. In fact, I think that we're likely to see the emergence of more problems of this kind of structure, in particular the tyranny of the contemporary playing out over multiple generations at the global level and posing these kinds of profound threats to humanity. It might turn out that, you know, climate change was the warm-up act <laughs> to it for other things. Uh, recently, uh, uh, Matthew Rendell has uh, produced a paper arguing exactly what you hinted at, that the, the gradual rise of nuclear weapons constitutes the tyranny of the contemporary, and there are heavy risks of moral corruption in that sphere as well. And again, that it might be in, in the long run even more serious than than climate change, but it has a similar kind of structure. So I would just say I'm completely on board with you with that suggestion. And indeed, that's often what I say to people who say, who very strongly insist, well, it's too late with climate change. We'll have to do something else about climate change. There's no time to have a global constitutional convention. I disagree with that claim, but you know, even conceding that, I say that's still not a reason not to move forward with the global constitutional convention idea because other examples will come up more or less inevitably, I suspect. So thank you, we agree, I think. Can I read this next, please? Yes, thank you very much for a very interesting uh, lecture. Uh, um, uh, for me, I think in particular, this uh, notion of this intergenerational gap, uh, the fact that those making decisions aren't necessarily affected by this was uh, well, um, well worth uh, thinking carefully about. And of course, what I'm, I'm going to, you have been talking at, at, the, at the really macroscopic level, but I try to also bring it down a little bit to the individuals. And of course this will, um, so what I want to query on about will probably not be a solution that is fast enough, but I still think it will be interesting because this spring, the Academy of Science and Letters have been also having a series on the preconditions for democracy. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, at one of these meetings, one of the questions was, of course, should we extend the um, when people are allowed to vote? So in, in a sense, lower the possibility of engagement from, from youth that are perhaps those that are most affected by this. Um, um, uh, of course, the next step then is, of course, we, we, we need to have democracy or, or at least have some possibility for people to influence their daily life. Um, so, of course, this also means that um, you would need some kind of uh, or need to push really hard for uh, improving education and literacy uh, across the globe. Mm -hmm. uh, and that in turn is also what often follows with literacy is um, higher consumption, um, ex increased expenditure. Um, so, so there is also some, yeah, some some uh, possible factors working towards uh, or against each other here. So, 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 so I, I would I would like to think uh, whether you think it's possible um, at the international level to try to bridge in one way or another this intergenerational gap. Uh, uh, because I, if you look at, of course, who sits in the negotiations, it's often a very narrow age group, and, uh, and often perhaps the more radical are on both ends of that, that age group. So, so I would be very interested in hearing your reflections on this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot there. Uh, I think, 
I think there is there are a bunch of important questions to be discussed around democracy and how to think of of the global constitutional convention or even just action in general on a problem like this in broadly speaking democratic terms um, including around what the preconditions are to make democracy effective including matters like education as you suggest i think um things like more inclusion for those who are are younger are very important uh, I personally would not be against you know extending the right to vote to younger people um, i think that would be a, a significant move but i doubt that by itself it's going to solve this kind of problem um, one thing that i'm always aware of because as i said at one point i expect the shadow solutions to evolve is that even the younger generations are not immune to being attracted to certain kinds of solutions that might be bad for humanity in the long term or at least for some of their successors so for example i think we might see a lot more enthusiasm for geoengineering radical geoengineering techniques like stratospheric sulfate injection from some amongst the younger people um, maybe for good reasons you know maybe they fear it's the only thing that can protect them to some level for some for some period of time while they're still around over the next hundred years but in thinking about that they might not be overly concerned with what the long-term implications are for humanity and so for future generations beyond them so just getting the younger people involved might help to readdress to address certain kinds of imbalances of power here but not all of them and not the whole intergenerational problem when it comes to you know thinking about democracy i always think it's what we usually mean by democracy is a fairly complicated beast as your question already indicated you know the, the way you put things um, so there for example um, we often think uh, in democracies, we have to put in place special protections for minorities and individuals, which are in a certain way anti-democratic, right? They, they are, there are things that, um, you know, majority vote does not get to override, at least by itself. Um, there's at least a much higher bar for overriding those protections. And I think we should be thinking of protections for future generations in that kind of way. Right. Um, there's still a broader sense of democracy because in de democratic regimes, um, there aren't many things that can survive the long term will of the majority, <laughs> even if protections are in place. Um, so, yes, there are issues about that. But more narrowly, I, I think we probably expect that many of the protections for future generations will not be simple majoritarian protections. They'll be more like bills of rights and other kinds of constitutional protections, I think. Good question, though. Thank you. Thank you. And then we have one more question, and the last one, I think, tonight, uh, which is from Jürgen Pedersen, please. Yes, thank you, and thanks for a great uh, talk. Uh, I'm afraid I'm, I, I share your uh, somewhat pessimistic uh, views on the possibility of uh, solving this, but uh, uh, sometimes there is, uh, I have some talk, talk with uh, some people in the business community, and they tend to uh, uh, be enthusiastic towards working for the sustainable development goals, and uh, uh, think that that might be uh, one way uh, uh, that might be uh, addressing some of the issues that we have. So I just wondered if you had some, uh, uh, if you could uh, reflect a bit on what you think about uh, the possibility of uh, the, uh, these sustainable development goals uh, creating a, more of a broad uh, uh, movement that can uh, solve some of the issues that we have. Yes, um, good question. Yeah, I actually think that many people involved in business, including in large corporations, are interested in the question of how to, you know, address these kinds of problems to be good corporate citizens, to be uh, 
good institutions um, on the planet in the long run. So I think part of our challenge here, even when thinking about the Global Constitutional Convention, is how to set up structures that will encourage those motivations and will allow people to see themselves as acting in these kinds of, of ways. Um, and any kinds of institutions we have in, in place will need to um, feed off of in a positive feedback loop, the actual motivations of people to protect future generations, to protect the poor, to protect the environment for its own sake and so on. So thinking very broadly, part of the task is how to create a system that creates you know, positive feedback loops around all of that. And I think the sustainable development goals were a step in the right kind of direction. Um, like many things, um, they uh, provide some energy and perhaps an umbrella uh, under which people can do things uh, that otherwise wouldn't be there and that can be helpful. I still think more broadly that we need um, institutions that have some real authority and some power around which uh, people can coalesce. So I still think that's going to be an important part of the equation here. But the spirit of the Sustainable Development Goals is a good spirit and it, it starts the right kinds of conversations um, across different communities. Uh, and hopefully, you know, if things were to go well <laughs> over the next few decades, the next century, we would develop a robust version or sort of robust vision of what um, being a green business and what being a green corporation, having just an economic system that's green would look like that all those involved could be feel pretty good about their activities within it. Whereas, you know, sadly, often in some sectors, at least, uh, the message is the opposite, right? That these things, being a part of that system is compromising ethically. And I don't think many people want that, right? So there's a, a positive kind of motivation we can tap into there. So that's a good project for someone else's book. I don't think I'm going to write that one, but it's a great idea. Thank you for the question. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for sharing your very interesting work with us and, and giving us this year's Academy Lecture in the Humanities and Social Sciences. Um, sadly, we cannot offer uh, a nice dinner and, and mingling afterwards, but uh, please accept our immense gratitude for this lecture. And thank you to everyone who has attended and asked questions and for the discussion. And um, yeah, what I guess what remains is just to wish you everyone a very nice and uh, relaxing evening. Thank you. Yeah, thank you everybody for coming and it was an honor and I, I really appreciate your attention. Thank you very much.